Hey, welcome to The Exploding Human. My name is Bob Nickman. My guest is Dr. Suzanne Faree, who specializes in performance and longevity medicine. And we're going to be talking about those things as well as peptides and various other topics around anti-aging, regenerative medicine, and longevity. But first, I'd like to invite you to visit my website, theexplodinghuman.com. Over there, you can listen to episodes, read synopses, see photos of my guests. It's also a little bio on myself. And there is a YouTube channel where you can also listen. That is The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman. As I said, my guest is Dr. Suzanne Faree. She is the founder of Medical Associates and the Cellular Medicine Institute. And we're going to be talking about the use of peptides in performance, longevity, and anti-aging, hormone replacement with bioidentical hormone therapy, and what we can learn from our lab work. We also get into talking about prostate health. So let's get into this. Here she is. This is Dr. Suzanne Faree. Good morning, Suzanne. I'm so glad you're here with me this morning. You're in Atlanta. I'm in where am I? I'm in Los Angeles, so I'm I'm happy to have you here. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask you is, you're an MD, but there's also many other letters after your name. Can you explain? Well, conventionally, MDs will put their fellowship initials after their name. So the um, uh, American Board of um, anti-aging medicine is A-B-A-A-R-M. Anti-aging and regenerative medicine is that first one. And that's just saying I'm board certified in anti-aging and regenerative medicine. And then not only that, but I went on to get the fellowship in anti-aging and regenerative medicine. So that's the F-A-A-R-M, which is okay. hilarious, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's, it means you studied some stuff. Okay. So yeah. when you see the two A's, it means anti-aging, which I guess, um, is something that a lot of people are interested in. Now that I'm 70, I'm a little more interested than I was when I was 25. That's for sure. Of course. But I think what most people want is if however long they do live, they want to feel good and they want to feel healthy. They want to have a, a as what, what people are calling it now, a health span. How long can I live and be healthy at the same time? Because who wants to have five, 10 years of crap. You don't want that. Right. We talk about using a square lifespan. So as opposed to a bell-shaped curve with a slow beginning and then a slow decline into death, we want the your life to be really healthy right up until the moment that you die. And then boom, you just take off. That's what our hopes are. That's my hope because I've seen mm -hmm. the opposite of that. And it's not fun to to watch somebody you love and care about have a slow decline where their, their life, you know, I mean, my own uh, father used to say to me, uh, I, I'm not sick enough to die and I'm not well enough to enjoy my life. And, um, mm -hmm. because I feel trapped, you know, because I'm constantly frustrated and, um, how you know, old was he when he passed? Well, pretty old 94. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. So as my buddy says, you got good numbers. My mom was 93 and my dad was 94. So, you know, I do have some, uh, you know, probably some genetic predisposition to li living a long life, but you know, who knows, who knows? Mm -hmm. And today I feel pretty good. So, um, and obviously I do this podcast cause that's one of the things that I, uh, am the most interested in is how to lead an optimally healthy life. And you, um, got involved with, well, I want to start with peptides cause can you explain what peptides are? This is all new to me this year. I did not know about this until this year. It's it's become this thing that people are talking about. What are they? Are they specific to different things? How do you take them? And my the question I have never had answered is what does it cost? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So peptides very simply are, um, think about a chicken breast. And we think about chicken breast having protein and fat in it as its components. And those proteins that are made, that are in chicken breast, for example, by convention, we say that a protein is anything that's over 150 amino acids in length. So in order to have a protein, you have to string together a sequence of amino acids that is unique to that particular protein. By convention, if it's between 50 and 150 amino acids long, we call it a polypeptide. 
and by convention under 50 amino acids we call a peptide. Anything under four amino acids we call a bioregulator peptide because it can also cross through the nucleus into the mitochondria and change the way that mitochondria function and the way the nucleus function. So that is, uh, that is the conventional terminology that we use to help us make decisions about them. Uh, peptides have been around since the 1920s or were discovered in the 1920s. Um, you think about Pavlov's dog. He was actually not studying the um, Pavlovian response. He was studying the production of saliva and some digestive enzymes in dogs. And digestive enzymes are a peptide. So uh, these are created by your body in the original sense. Insulin is a peptide, for example. Growth hormone is a peptide. Uh, we make them all the time to do all kinds of jobs in our body. They um, cause things to happen that we want to happen. So the creation of energy for every cell requires multiple peptides to, to make that process occur. The creation of other peptides requires multiple peptides to make that occur. So these are happening in our body all the time, and we have been discovering them very slowly over time. The first one was secretin. Um, another famous one is oxytocin. You probably have heard of oxytocin. That's the love hormone that's produced particularly when uh, during childbirth for the attachment of the mother and baby, but also it's used, it's, uh, its pharmaceutical version, pitocin, is used to help with women to contract the uterus. Um, and so that's the example that we have, or one of many examples we have. Because pharmaceutical companies are not allowed to patent a natural substance, they have to slightly modify it in order for it to be used in the body. Often this does allow us to take advantage of the um, effects of the peptide in a greater to a greater extent. And um, this is one of the reasons. So for example, the, the newer uh, weight loss and diabetes peptides that are available, the GLP-1 analogs like semaglutide are slightly modified from the original peptide that is created by your body in order to prevent it from being degraded by the enzyme that normally breaks it down and in order to allow it to bind to a carrier protein to be transported around the body. Okay, so that being said, <laughs> what's Pepto-Bismol? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I think ideally, probably, we want our bodies to... Uh, function uh, and our peptides to function properly without any sort of intervention, if we can do that. Yes. Uh, and, but when it, when that isn't the case, let's say, uh, now I was talking to a guy who um, right before the, the interview, he said, Oh, I just injected some peptides. And I'm like, well, why would you do that? <laughs> he didn't tell me why I didn't really ask him that. I'm thinking, why did you do that? Why do people do this? What 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 are the most common uses that people would say? Oh, I I need to go down this road because these things aren't working. And you know, I'm sure there's things that are more common than other things. We know that aging begins around the age of 35 or 40. That if we talk about lifespan being sort of a pinnacle, and then the pinnacle sort of declines past an age, that age is somewhere between 35 and 40. If you think about professional athletes, um, most of them, their optimal, their peak performance time occurs in that 25 to 30 range, and then their performance declines. And this is really because the reproductive age is then and our our reproduction begins to decline after that point so uh if we're thinking um uh teleologically or or whatever that that this is a um, process that's occurring in order to preserve the species to continue to maintain uh the ability of the species to to generate itself or regenerate itself and so um our bodies will decrease their production of the more youthful peptides as we age. So youthful peptides being things like the thymus gland or immune system peptides, the um, more youthful peptides like growth hormone, releasing hormone, 
like ghrelin, things that are going to cause our body in general to behave in a more youthful style, those will decline as we age. Growth, uh, GHKCU is a perfect example. We de decrease that by significant numbers as we age. It starts out somewhere in the 200s. It goes down to something like 60 when we're in our 60s. So this is a um, process of declining presence of these more useful peptides. If we can give those to ourselves exogenously, the, uh, the reasonably science-based theory is that we can prolong our youthful life. And when I say reasonably science-based, most of the science is done in animals. Uh, there isn't a lot of human data. There is some for sure. Uh, but there is there isn't a tremendous amount of, of human data, but there is a lot of animal data supporting its use in um, anti-aging reasons, as well as just general health reasons. Yeah. So give me an example of somebody that might come to you with an issue that you would recommend peptides. I just I, I like the anecdotal kind of stories because that can really it's, it's kind of like I, you can talk to me about music theory, but I, if I don't hear the music, I have no idea what's going on. Right. So there's two kind of patients who come to me. Um, one is a sick patient who has uh, some sort of illness. So she, I have one right now, she's in her mid 60s. She has MS, uh, um, primary progressive MS. And we treated her with, a, with several of the thymus gland peptides, as well as a few of the mitochondrial peptides to get her moving. We made some lifestyle changes. And, and what I always encourage people to keep in mind, this is a um, an icing on the cake type, type therapy for a lot of people. So I want you to make sure if you're not taking care of your microbiome and your intestine, if you're not taking care of your diet, if you're not moving your body, most of these aren't really going to help very much. Some of them will do some things, but th there's a lot of lifestyle things that must be done, sleeping well, managing stress, um, meditation, yoga, all the things. And, and so on top of that, we'll add things like these uh, peptides that work on the immune system, that work on the mitochondria, so that the mitochondria are telling the nucleus which proteins and peptides to be transcribing so that they can be used in the body to create this more youthful state as opposed to continuing to produce this age declining state. So a lot of these uh, diseases that people get, some of the chronic stuff, and maybe even MS, I don't know, are, are, are lifestyle diseases that uh, be, because people aren't taking care of themselves uh, properly with nutrition and sleep and the stress, that a lot of this stuff gets exacerbated. There may be, you know, a genetic predisposition to that those things, obviously. I think what you just said was really important that people need to do their part in other words we'll meet you there but you gotta you gotta come to the party with you know the goods exactly and there are patients that we will say it, it doesn't appear that you are aligned with our way of practicing medicine and our way of believing that people should be and so when you're ready for that please come back but in the meantime i want to give your spot to someone else i only have a hundred patients right now so i mm -hmm want to be sure that those people are actively participating in their care. Uh, I have another patient who has a pretty significant kidney um, disease that is autoimmune related in a similar way. And we've treated him similarly with some autoimmune peptides with or some immune peptides with some mitochondrial peptides. Um, but also we've given him several of the growth hormone related peptides to try to reverse this ship that has gone awry for him to improve his immune system overall. We know that the growth hormone is very involved in protecting the um, thymus gland from continued fat decline. Um, the thymus gland is replaced with fat as we age. And so this these growth hormone peptides can help with uh, reversing that, that thymic fat fraction. The second kind of category of patient that we see commonly are uh, entrepreneurs, um, CEOs of corporations who are at the prime of their life and don't want it to stop. And they're um, competing in whatever their sport is of preference, their tennis or their whatever. And they want to be able to continue doing both their career and their sport at their optimal level, whatever that is for them. And so helping them to be able to recover faster 
is our, also part of our goal and keeping them cognitively sharp so that they can continue to do their career at their optimal level as well. So there's specific things that you're targeting with some patients, and then there's an overall kind of uh, health to make it um, so so people can function at an optimal level. Is, those are different, probably different treatments and different uh, uh, approaches. Exactly, exactly. All right. Well, I um, have noticed uh, being, you know, 70 years old, that there are certain things that um, are not the same, of course. Um I get injured in my sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. That's always cracks me up. You go to bed, you go, I feel pretty good. And you get, a, what happened to my shoulder? I wasn't doing it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that kind of, and, and the recovery times for uh, injuries or illness seem to be a little bit longer too, as I've aged, not significantly, but enough that I notice it where I'm like, wow, this bruise is like taking like a week and a half where it used to be like a day or a couple of days. You look at the number of stem cells that we have in our body when we're infants versus the number of stem cells we have in our bodies when we're 60 or 70. It's a dramatic difference between the early stage and the later stage. And the, um, the ability to recover from injury is, it is a real thing if, if you didn't know it already from your own personal experience. So the idea with treating with peptides is to restore the natural levels of recovery um, so that you, and of your own stem cells, so that you can recover faster from injury, recover faster from whatever you've gone through. So we, there are some repair peptides that we use in um, things like tendonitis and arthritis uh, in, in those sort of inflammatory states. What's the delivery system? I know that injection is one of them. Is there, are there other delivery systems? So it depends on the peptide. Many of them are by injection. Some of them are available topically and some of them by oral route of administration. The, the majority of the oral ones are the smaller peptides, the three, four amino acids. Uh, there are a few ways we can pair these peptides with other chemicals that will help us to bypass the stomach problem. There's a, um, a molecule called SNAC that improves the way that the peptides are absorbed in the stomach. It still requires much higher doses than would be required to take it by injection. So the expense is greater, not only for the SNAC, but also for the um, higher dose of peptide. And they can be pricey, as you suggested. Um, the um, depending on the the month, each peptide can cost around two hundred and fifty to five hundred dollars per month. And we're usually talking about stacking two to four peptides at a time, and then rotating them every three to four months, depending on what your program is. Yeah, so it's so you're looking at a thousand dollars a month for a lot of people. I'm here, exactly. Yeah. So that that's um. That's about what I spend at Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good lifestyle change. Yeah. I don't go there, but I just thought that would be something, you know, but when people here, <laughs> let me say this. Yes, it's expensive. But if you, I think people that, and I, and I have never done this and I'd be curious just to see how I felt, but you know, it's priorities. I think people sometimes will not realize how much, they're spending and how much time they're giving to things that don't help them at all, or just, you know, frivolous, uh, if you want to put a judgment on it, which I just did. So the, uh, well, your $300 cable bill, for example. Yeah. What yes. is that getting you folks? You don't need all that cable. That's what we're, that's what, that's what we're here to talk about today is cable. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good example, though, of mm -hmm. I got to have 90,000 channels and, uh, you know, watch two, you know, it's uh, that. It, but, you know, and also uh, eating at, uh, out at restaurants and which actually isn't very healthy when you think about the way they prepare even, you know, put seed oils on things everywhere, which has become something that is uh, determined to be not very healthy, folks. That's what we. That's what we know. This is this is my sort of uh, take on restaurants. I d I don't uh, enjoy how I feel after I eat at a restaurant. I really don't. 
Um, and uh, I don't even like to be waited on. It's kind of creepy to me, too. Is that wrong? Mm. Is that a wrong thing to think? I mean, I know people no. like they have their jobs and you want to support people, but why am somebody bringing me my stuff? I... <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Who brings was... it to you at home? I, what'd you say? Who brings it to you at home? Me. Yeah. Yeah. Me, me and my wife, we do it together. Mm -hmm. I mean, if anybody brings it to me, if, if it's not me, it's her. And vice versa. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I'd like to say it's 50 50, but overall it is. It's 50 <laughs> 50. Um, okay. So now let's talk about something else that you mentioned, which is hormones. Cause I know uh, I was looking at your bio and you were, they were talking, you were talking about uh, whoever wrote the bio, bioidentical hormones as opposed to synthetic. And who's who's a candidate for that? And how do we know when our hormones are balanced or not balanced? Like, I'm not having hormonal issues as far as I know, but I don't know what the numbers are of of that. Oh, is there a panel that checks that out? And how do you balance it? And is it worth the time and effort if it's not, you know, if it's less than optimal, but not so awful that you're you're feeling bad? Sure. There is. There are a couple of reasons why it's important, even in men, uh, for us to figure out what your hormones are. So we order either a blood or a saliva or a urine, and there's just three different ways to look at it, uh, levels of hormones. And there's a panel of hormones that we order on patients. And we will, um, we will, if you're, if you're a man, one of the things that's concerning, we look at things like Again, how's your recovery? What's your percent body fat? Because if your per percent body fat is fairly high, I can guarantee you that your uh, hormones are out of balance. Uh, if your, um, how's your sleep? What's your bone density, especially over the age of 50? Because hormones are very intricately involved in bone density and the ability to regenerate bone as we age. And so I would look at all of those factors as we're uh, thinking about hormones. Then um, the other thing that's concerning is a decline in estrogen will affect the way that you are able to retain long-term memory. So uh, being able to hold memories from whatever you learn or, or read about today for the next several months or for whatever period of time that is affected significantly by your estrogen presence. So is everyone a candidate? I would say the answer is yes. Does everyone qualify? Are there things that would be concerning? I would say an active cancer would certainly be a disqualifier for um, for hormone replacement therapy. But then other than that, we would need to just have a discussion about what your needs are, what your goals are, and what your symptoms are, and then um, what your history is. And if we need to be cautious in light of, there are more expansive panels we can do in light of uh, people's family history or personal history that can be helpful. Most of the time, if we start out with some sort of significant detoxification, most patients are able to, and that can that's can be a, a wide variety of things. It can be dietary alone. It can be all kinds of things. But if often just that will help to balance hormones, resetting the microbiome can help balance hormones. So obviously gut health is significant part of the, of that. We know that, that those are critical to be um, actively monitored and uh, managed before we start you on some sort of hormone replacement therapy, because they are involved in how the body processes the hormones after you receive them. Mm. So let's say your microbiome is disrupted when you take a hormone either topically or, or um, by injection or in many other forms, the uh, microbes will um, break off. Most of them get a little flag attached to them that says this is for the trash. And so they go out through the stool. Well, the microbiome, if it's not working properly or if it's out of out of balance, then it's going to cleave off that flag and those hormones get recycled. So the levels just keep going up and up and up as we are unable to release them because of the 
imbalance in the microbiome. So all of that needs to be addressed first, and then we add on hormones second. Again, lifestyle is is really the, the start for all of it. For all of it. Obviously, different people process things differently. Uh, genetically, mm-hmm. they're they're just different. You know, some people, I, I did a, a genetic uh, profile uh, mm-hmm. and uh, it was very interesting stuff, you know, from mood and behavior, even through, you know, cardiovascular and um, <clears throat> methylation and, and what gene I had, uh, what version of the gene I have. And so I, I have a whole, I have my history or my genetic uh, readout. And some of the things that came up were really interesting, particularly in mood and behavior. Like, oh, I do have this tendency to be this way. And so, you know, Mm -hmm. free will, I'm not so sure. You know, there's there's a biological, you know, I sort of look at it like um, there's only so far you can move away from your biology, your genetics. Uh, And, you know, you can you can alter things and and make them as optimal as possible. For instance, um, uh, the ability to build uh, muscle mass is not something that I'm super predisposed to do well. Not that I'm. I have a terrible version of it or anything, but it's not optimal. Let's put it that way. And I always mm-hmm. wonder why is it that I can't do that? And I don't even try to do it that hard, but, um, and I know it's important as I age to, 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 uh, to do that, but I'm like, um, is there a way to do that? Is there a way to up that and to have that work better? Does peptides, does, um, hormone replacement, does, um, stem cell, which we'll, I want to get into too, a little bit of, because I know that's part of the whole thing that's going on now too, is some overall stem cell. I, I'm talking a lot of stuff here. Grab onto something I said. <laughs> so, so yes. So the most important thing about uh, muscle building is consistency. That's the hardest part is consistency, you know, getting to the gym, being consistent You know, I go four days a week for an hour and a half to two hours every time. And I've been doing that for five years. That's how I built muscle. It's not by any of the peptides I use. It's not by any of the other things I do. It's consistency. So it's funny to be in the gym and overhear other people talking, saying, hey, how, when, when am I going to start to see results? How am I going to start to see? And it, it's, it's a process. And if, and often those are people who are not coming consistently, they'll have an excuse why they can't come on Tuesday and, oh, it's a holiday. So I'm not coming that day. You know, uh, obviously I'm competitive. I'm, I'm a, in um, competition. So I'm doing this for a reason. There's a, there's a uh, purpose in being so consistent, but the, the outcome of the consistency is the ability to build muscle over my lifetime and hopefully to be able to maintain my muscle over my lifetime. Um, so number one, consistency, um, number two, you have to eat. And this is a big problem for women because we have a tendency to say, oh, I don't want to eat too much because I'll get too fat. And um, if you are doing resistance training, it's much more difficult for you to um, to put on body fat. It's not impossible, obviously. And women over 40, I'm highly encouraging them to be very involved in resistance exercise, but you have to eat at least a minimum amount of calories. And there are ways we can figure out what that minimum is for you in order to maintain muscle mass. Otherwise, you're catabolic or burning through muscle in order to create energy because the body will use sugar, fat, or protein to make energy. And if it's, if you aren't taking in enough calories, you're going to get that catabolic or body breakdown, including bone um, in your life. So you have to be taking in adequate calories. The um, third thing I would say is working on recovery. So I only do four days a week because I need those days of recovery. I didn't need this many days of recovery when I was 20, but I need them now. Mm -hmm. And um, training as hard as I am, I need to make sure that I'm persisting with my rest days and um, sleeping at night, getting adequate sleep at night. So all of that is part of muscle building. And then what I'm the composition of what I'm eating. So making sure I'm getting adequate protein. And this is one of the biggest concerns for people over 40 is they tend to not eat as much protein. You know, chicken breast has about 30 grams of protein for my um, exercise and my plan, I need to be eating around 120 grams of protein a day. So that's like four chicken breasts. 
And so that's quite a bit of volume of food. So I do some supplements um, in order to get to that 120 number, but uh, it, making sure you're taking in adequate nutrients and the correct macros in those nutrients around your workouts is really important if muscle building is your goal. Um, hydration, there's a few, you know, creatine is one of the things that we know has some really good research on its muscle building ability, certainly testosterone in adequate doses, adequate amounts, either in your, in your own body or exogenous testosterone as we age in order to, um, reach a normal level of testosterone. And then, um, being able to, because it is anabolic or, or bodybuilding. So you will be able to, you won't be able to build muscle if your testosterone is too low. And then your, uh, we add things on for muscle recovery, things like, um, the growth hormone secretagogues that are going to improve your recovery time and improve your ability to, um, to sustain injury and quickly bounce back. It seems uh, overwhelming when you hear it all at once, but I think as you move through that kind of thing, you kind of figure out what works for you. I'm sure you, you know, you have to be a little bit of a test tube for yourself. I think, you know, what works, that doesn't work. That does work. And I've tried most of them on myself. So. Yeah. I've tried a bunch of stuff. Some of it works, some of it doesn't. Sounds like you are very um, active in your health personally, as well as helping other people. It, it does take a lot of mindfulness and time to, to do this stuff. Um, I always wonder how much do I really want to do uh, and, and how much, do, you know, am I like, this is good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Some days I'm like, eh. Another reason not to work out is I don't feel like it. That's a really good reason. <laughs> it's another one. Mm -hmm. Those weights are heavy. I do yoga. That's my, my big one. And I'm I love very, it. very consistent with that. And yeah. I, I just started incorporating some uh, other strength training, but I don't like it. I don't like it, but I do. I'm doing it anyway until I like it. I'm going to do it until I like it. <laughs> we say in my office, um, because I have uh, other uh, bodybuilders in the office or muscle builders in the office. And um, we say, I love it. I love it. I love it when we're eating. And it's like the last bite of chicken breast or turkey sandwich or whatever it is you're like i can barely eat one more bite you're like i love it i love it i love it <laughs> get the last bite because you got to get you know you have to count those macros you've got to get that last bite in even if you don't feel like it yeah i guess so i mean there's things you know there's things that um, work really well that aren't always fun let's put it that way Do you feel better when you get done with the workout yes that's okay. what that's why i go back that's me too. Yeah. I can think of a thousand reasons why I shouldn't go. Yeah. And no, then I, I do say, feel you, better. You have to go. You'll feel so much better if you just go. Yeah. I, well, I have that with yoga too. There's days I just don't feel like going um, to the, mm -hmm. to the place and uh, I don't want to do it at home because I'm not disciplined enough to pull the routines off. And I do like a little bit of uh, the energy of having multiple people in, in a room. I, I like that. I like the human connection and I like the, being pushed a little bit, but there's days I'm like, I don't want to be here and I get there and I don't want to do it. And I start. And by the end, I'm like, boy, I'm really glad I did that. I have a, a team that I, or a, um, a crew that I train with and they expect me to be there. If I'm not there, they want to know why. And they're <laughs> calling me saying, are you okay? What's yeah. wrong? <laughs> you know, cause I'm, I'm always there. Yeah. They go, what's wrong? Nothing. I just don't feel like helping you today. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because we depend on each other. You know, the, the weight that we lift is pretty heavy. And so you have to depend on the other people to bought you all that. And so if I'm not present, there's a, there's a, a weak link there. One of the biggest health things, and people don't talk about this, there's a, it's the mental health aspect of it that feeds the physical health is connection with other people. You don't hear many health practitioners talking about it. But for me, I think that is like, you know, they talk about it for longevity communities that where people live a long time, they talk about that. That's the only time I've really heard it talk about. It. I've never had a doctor tell me that what's your social situation? Who are, are you involved with people? They don't ask that question. Never, never. Mm -hmm. It's and the um, let me talk about this for a second. The labs that they order a conventional sort of, you know, your family doctor, they're very limited. 
I don't know if they're limited because, well, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is insurance doesn't want to pay for them. The doctors aren't that interested in, in, in them beyond this certain red flag kind of issue. And um, I did ask my doctor to order some labs and he, he got back to me and he goes, why? Why do you want these? When I told him why I wanted them, he ordered them. But he mm -hmm. said, I don't know if the insurance will pay for it. I don't know, but I'll try. So he's a good yeah. guy, you know, but no one, no one asks him these, asks for, for these things. So let me advocate for asking for labs. Absolutely. We do, the panel we do is probably 20 to 25 labs. And every time I order it, I say, oh, I know this is going to be, it's because it'll take me probably, I don't know, 30 to 45 minutes to review your labs with you. So we set up a follow-up appointment 10 days after the labs are drawn just to go over your labs because it's going to take me a full visit just to discuss them. And a conventional doctor probably has seven minutes. So that's all they have to be able to discuss the labs. They don't have 45 minutes to be able to sit down with you and say, okay, what did you eat the morning of this? What did you have to eat the night before? Okay. Is there a stressor happening? Did your mom die? Did you just have COVID? What's what's going on in your life that your cortisol might be high or your DHEA might be low or your what's happening um, that your lymphocytes are low? Did you just get a vaccine recently? What happened? So we're we're looking at these variables uh, in this big panel, and they all relate together. I can't look at any one of them individually. I have to look at the entire picture and. There's a million more I could do because everything depends on the other. And there are three or four tests that tell me about your thyroid. There are three or four tests that tell me about your, you know, hormone panels that they're 10 or 15 tests long. The reason for that is I want to look at every single aspect of your health if I can. Um, you know, not everything is available in blood and no test is perfect, but we do the best we can with what we have available. And um, we... Pair that with your symptoms as well as your history, and um, often we'll come up with some really interesting results. Yeah, and that's a whole skill in itself is reading the labs and interpreting them. I don't know how much that is even discussed in medical school. I don't know. Um, I think part of this problem is the gap between bench science medicine and clinical patient medicine. I think there's a big gap there that's not um, bridged. And, you know, if you look at the labs and you look at what an average normal is, it's an average normal of all the patients who send in their blood to that particular lab. But that doesn't mean it's the optimal level for the patient. When you go into the science and you read about alkaline phosphatase or you read about albumin or you read about lymphocyte count to, you know, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratios, you really see that there's a the the range that's on the lab is only so you don't die. It's not <laughs> it's not so that you are functioning in your optimal health. And so a blood sugar, for example, of one of 99 is considered normal. A blood sugar of 126 is diabetes. 125 is normal. So the, the research shows that for a blood sugar over 87, this is fasting morning blood sugar, over 87, for every point above 87 that that fasting blood sugar goes, your risk for developing diabetes in the next 10 years goes up by 6%. So if we have a um, 97 blood sugar, we have a 60% increased risk of developing diabetes in the next 10 years. No one's talking about that. Yeah. And I want to know, and this is the patients that I see, you know, the patients who are coming to me, they don't want to wait until they have diabetes to be told they have diabetes. They want to know that their blood sugar is trending in the wrong direction. What can we do to, to, to right that ship? We'll keep an eye on it till it hits the bad number is yeah. foolish. It's foolish. And I know particularly with, <clears throat> I because I did a little looking into uh, testosterone in particular, that the uh, optimal ranges have been lowered over time. Like the, the testosterone was higher back in the 40s and 50s, 60s even, than it is now. And, and um, 
they're, they, some of the people are even talking about if it's, a, if it's above, you know, 900, I think it was, it was that that was dangerous for your heart. Just mm. stuff that's not really, from what I've, everything I've read, not true. And not based in science. You're exactly right, Bob. It's, it's, um, there's so much evidence that, that, high, that a normal testosterone level will improve uh, cardiovascular risk. I have two things I want to ask you about what, you know, people talk about cell food. What is that? And how do I have that working for me the, the best that I can? And I know food is very important, of course. So the, it's interesting, um, our cells ability to make and use energy as we age declines. And so the cell has a choice and it's somewhat based on what's available. It's kind of like you're hungry, you go to the kitchen, you look in the refrigerator, you can pick a bag of Twizzlers, you can pick uh, an avocado, or yeah. you can pick a chicken breast. And so the cell has the same options. And so it's trying to decide what's gonna give it the most energy to be able to do its job without too much energy left over that it has to then go through the process of storing somewhere. And so the if when we're eating too many calories, obviously the storage occurs, we get these lipid droplets inside the cell that act as storage and we end up gaining um, weight. If we eat uh, the wrong kinds of calories, we can have an excess of one macro, for example, you know, carb, protein, fat, we can end up with an excess of one macro and that also can be stored in these lipid droplets. And so what we really want to do is have this uh, optimal balance among those um, macros based on your activity level and what your goals for your health are. So the cell has a choice. It can use uh, glucose or sugar by itself. That gives you about two packets of energy. It can give, it can use glucose with oxygen, and that can give you about 30 packets of energy. It can use fat with oxygen, and that gives you about a hundred packets of energy. We don't want it to use protein because that's a catabolic state where you're burning muscle and that's not ideal. So uh, obviously for fasting purposes, if that's if that's what you're doing, there may be reasons why that would be a, a state you'd want to go into, but the uh, for health reasons other than that, but for an optimal healthy body, we really want to maintain or gain muscle mass as we can, and then use fat or sugar with oxygen as a process. If the cell has the ability to do that, to do glucose with or sugar with oxygen or fat with oxygen, it's in a way better state than if it's using glucose alone, which is um, glycolysis. That process is very fast. It's very efficient, but it is um, energy consuming. And over time, the cells will become very stressed if that's what they're doing, because it doesn't give them enough energy to continue to function long term. You're not talking about people eating sugar for the glucose. You're just talking about the way glucose is, kind of works in the body. Or, or are you saying that? Well, you know, I know, certainly I know people... sugar for glucose, but also, you know, a, a piece of um, everything is ultimately converted. Most things are ultimately converted to glucose. Um and uh, so like a baked potato, for example, or a um, or rice, for example, also converted to glucose as it's broken down into its um, uh, into its integral parts. Um, the um, the glucose it comes from a lot of the things that we eat, not just from sugar, but also from yeah. other you know carbohydrates in general. OK. All right. So I'm. Um... Wondering about something specific, being a man, which is prostate issues. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just say that I have had that uh, ongoing. It's not terrible. It's not great. Uh, I've had, I take supplements uh, for it, which helps. I would like to completely eliminate prostate issue issues. And I think a lot, most of the men I know that are my age, they're getting up at night. You don't want to do that if you don't have to. Um, I had somebody say to me, take um, activated charcoal along with probiotic, and that will help with the inflammation that is causing it. I haven't done that. Um, 
I don't know if that'll work. At one point in my history, and I'm going, I'm just, I don't know, I, I haven't talked about this with anybody on this show. Um, so I feel comfortable talking to you about this. I had a, I had a, an infection when, in, when I was young and it, it has never completely been the same. Um, I didn't do much lifestyle changes or anything back when this happened. I was in my twenties, you know, so now I'm 70 and it's, I still have this issue. Is there a way to eliminate this problem? Have you seen a way or at least make it so it isn't even, uh, I don't even have to talk about it. <laughs> That's what, you know what I'm saying? So there's a couple of things. Um, realize that benign prostatic hypertrophy is a sympathetic dominant state. So the sympathetic nervous system is part of the autonomic nervous system. There's the fight or flight response that's sympathetic. There's the parasympathetic, which is the rest and relax response. Benign prostatic hypertrophy is triggered by sympathetic dominance of the nerves leading to the prostate. So one of the things we do in our office is a procedure called neural therapy, where we do an infiltration of the inferior hypogastric nerve with a um, chemical called procaine, which is the original local anesthetic. After they figured out that cocaine was addictive, they changed the molecule to be procaine. And um, we use that because of its cell membrane resetting properties. And uh, that is the, that's what we do for our patients at our office. That's one of the things we do. And we get really great results um, when we, when we see that. The second thing I do in those patients is a, in my patients is a topical estriol cream. Estriol is the little known uh, um, ugly stepsister of estrogen. Estrogen is um, estradiol. And Estriol, if applied in a cream to the shaft of the penis daily, can bind to the receptors on the prostate that can cause enlargement and can actually shrink the size of the prostate over time. So I will also put those patients on an estriol, topical estriol cream that they apply daily. Um, there, That does take a little bit more time. It's not automatic. Obviously, there are procedures that can be done, TURP and lots of other green light laser, other things that can be done to shrink the size of the prostate. Um, they are certainly more invasive than the two I mentioned, but uh, those are options. So anything that you're doing for vagal nerve stimulation should be helpful because it's decreasing that sympathetic drive in the body. So the vagus nerve is what you're talking mm -hmm. about. Okay. So... So things like breathing exercises, yoga, all of those should be helpful. But you're probably optimized. You've probably gotten the max benefit from yoga that you can since you do it regularly. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Um, so how come no one's told me this, any of this? No one. You go to a urologist, they don't talk about this stuff. They go take, the, take you know, and I, which I really haven't done uh, in decades because they just gave me some sort of a, pill to uh, deal with infection but mm -hmm. obviously that's not the issue now it's a whole other thing that you're telling me which i i feel kind of stupid that i never found out this stuff before i mean why would you feel stupid the um the urologist doesn't know it yeah i feel stupid because i like it i like to feel stupid <laughs> <laughs> it's just a word I use. I, well, yeah, I know. Isn't that amazing? Now here's here's a professional person, and uh, they went through college. They're smart. They pass all the tests. They do this every day, and yet, you know, they they haven't learned this. And obviously, you weren't taught a lot of this stuff in conventional medical school. No. Um, so where did what happened that you went, I got to find out more. I always find this interesting with my guests that are MDs when they, they go, well, you know, I left medical school and I just felt like I didn't have the knowledge I wanted. Something was missing or many things were missing. What happened that you went, oh, I got to find out more. This is not, this is not complete. It was really patients. You know, they were getting sick. They were sick that I, I knew they were sick, they weren't making it up. And 
the conventional things I was doing weren't showing the problem and they weren't getting better. And so just trying to find what's another tool, what's another thing, how can I help them to get better? Because I really want to um, make sure I want to provide whatever things facilitate. That's what I consider myself as a facilitator. Um, I want to facilitate their healing in whatever way is possible. If I can, you know, grease those wheels to make them uh, give them access to things that they wouldn't otherwise otherwise have access to, to help facilitate their healing. And if you're not getting better from the things I've been taught how to do, then what else is out there? What else can we learn? And this is where, again, that gap between bench science medicine and the um, clinical patient medicine, um, trying to be that bridge. And there are there are several of, of us who are working on being that bridge. When you hear people talk about cellular medicine, that's what we're talking about is trying to be the bridge between the bench research and the um, uh, the practice of medicine in the clinic with the patient. Okay, well, see, this makes complete sense to me. Did you go to further education in other arenas? Like Absolutely. And... I did a, a lot of, um, mm -hmm. and then I sit down and read, I probably read four or five journal articles every morning. That's There's absolutely no way I'm going to keep up with the ridiculous volume of, of research that's out there. Oh, it's unbelievable. But that's my yeah. best attempt is to to uh, try to read four or five journal articles every day. And they're usually on the subjects that I'm interested in because of the patients that I've seen in the last week. So I'll say, oh, I've had three patients with benign prostatic hypertrophy. Let me go research what's the primary problem, what's the disease date, and how do we correct it? Is there anything that we're not doing? Oh, what is this um, sympathetic nervous system Thing with benign prostatic hypertrophy, how interesting that this is. And there's tons of research out there on the sympathetic nervous system and prostatic hypertrophy. The inferior hypergastric nerve is the nerve that supplies the prostate. And if we can turn down the sympathetic drive in that nerve, then wow, we can improve people's um, ability to their ability to urinate. They come back and say, I feel like I'm peeing like a 14 year old. Oh, that would be amazing. So, so it literally <laughs> is a numbing of, of a nerve. Is that, what, is that well, what you're saying? That's what that's, you know, it's a local okay. anesthetic. So mm -hmm. that's what its initial effect is for about 20, 15 or 20 minutes. Okay. But the effect on the cell membrane is what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to get that cell membrane to repolarize. So instead of staying in this constant sympathetic dominant state, it's able to be flexible and go back and forth between that parasympathetic and sympathetic, depending on what's happening in the cell, because a constant sympathetic state is going to send messages to the brain and to the immune system. Oh my gosh, something is wrong. The sky is falling. Please come help and fix me. So all the healing elements come to the area. Hypertrophy begins to happen. Scar formation begins to happen. And now we block off the ability of urine to exit. And then we begin to create problems at the kidney level because of the problems at the prostate level. So it's this is a it's a um, sequential worsening potentially over time. So that treatment would actually be kind of like a resetting the hard drive of the, of that area. It, it's potentially, like yes. Yeah, and and it. So even though it's a 20 minute numbness, when that's over, something resets, not necessarily yes. after one treatment or maybe several. No, it requires several, usually, uh, usually about it's weekly and it, it requires anywhere from eight to 12 weekly sessions. Hmm. That's a commitment. It is. Is it painful? Mildly, Mildly. like getting any shot. Oh, okay. Where's the shot go? There's a uh, window in the abdominal wall where the muscle layers come together and there's an opening in that. So it's just in the abdominal wall down near the pelvis. Oh, okay. I thought maybe it was coming in the back door. So that would not be as much fun. No, no. <laughs> you, know, um, you can charge me for this if you want. Send me a bill. <laughs> Where do you find somebody that does this? I mean, I guess I'd have to go uh, on, online or what do I, you know, I don't think my own primary care doctor knows about this. There are several and uh, there are several doctors who do it. I can look and see if I can find someone who does it in your area. The National Association of Neurotherapists mm -hmm. is um, out there, N-A-A-N-T. 
and um, they would have a list of providers who do oh, okay. ne- neural therapy is what that's called. Um, and so that's an option. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Look at me finding stuff out. I could I could talk to you for like nine hours, but we're not going to do that, are we? If folks want to get a hold of you, is there anything that you would like to promote in terms of your website? Or I don't know yes. if you've, uh, I, I didn't thoroughly, well, I did read what I was sent, but I might, I might have missed something. So I have let's, a, let's promote um, you. Let's global. promote you and your work. Yes. I have a new book out called Counterclockwise. Oh, it's yes. Available That's what I Amazon. forgot. Okay. So I need treatment from yes. memory because I forgot the counterclockwise. But okay, go it's ahead. It's very exciting. I, I got my first five star review this week. So I'm really excited about that. I know. Yay. Yeah. That's huge. So uh, that is out this week. It's been, um, I started writing a year ago, January. So it's been a long journey. My publisher went out of business mid book. So that was a big challenge. <laughs> Yeah. So here we are and it's done and it's on the racks. So it's very exciting. Um, if you need to get hold of me, I'm uh, on Instagram at, at Dr. S Free, D R S F E R R E E. And the book is on Amazon. It's called Counterclockwise. Well, I'm so happy to have, uh, to have met you. What a wonderful talk. I think if I, would love to have you back sometime because there's so much that I can learn and my, my audience, um, l- they love these topics because we're pushing toward the future and improving uh, with knowledge what we can do to improve our health and uh, our, our health and optimal optimal living, vibrant health. Let's go with vibrant. I love that. That's, That's great. My, it's my favorite word today. Mm-hmm today (laughs) not every day so i'm trying to end this thing but i'm not sure how to do it maybe you can help me (laughs) we'll say it's it's been a pleasure there you go it's been a pleasure for me too thank you so much for for being here and best of luck on the book and uh, folks get the book you're going to find out how to turn back the clock you will you'll do it you'll read the book and you'll go oh i can do this practical actionable things in there. Yes. 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 I, I can tell by talking to you that that's the case. Yeah. Actionable. No, that's my, that's my new favorite word. Things you can do. Vibrant, okay. actionable. Vibrant and actionable living. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to even keep this in during the edit, but it's, <laughs> you know, we like to ramble at the end so we can go back into our day as just like regular folks instead of, uh, you know, official uh, podcast people. Thank you, Suzanne. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Bob. Hi, this is Dr. S. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to my channel.